Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Going into your secret closet. 
So he said, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. That's the text. Now let's talk about it very quickly. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you get it. So, before you ask him. So let's look at it. The way he treats prayer in these verses is two sets of negatives and positives. The first negative tells us how to how not to pray, while the first positive tells us how to pray. So, we looked at the elements of prayer. We went all the way down to verse 7. So, if you will, I'm going to move in past the negatives and the positives and take us to the beginning of understanding the power of prayer. Right here. It's important. We need to have a time for prayer. When do you pray? When do you refuel? When do you take advantage of the privilege of being able to walk into heaven and touch God through prayer? So there's an importance of a daily prayer, meaning that we need to pray with God daily because we can communicate with Him, and it's not to be overestimated. Do you realize it is, said, it is so important that it's mentioned over 250 times in Scripture that we pray? God said, when you get up, prayer shouldn't be a second thought. Prayer should be what you do. You just lost your opportunity to walk into glory and connect with God. And then we talk to you. First, daily prayer gives us the opportunity to share all the aspects of our life with God. Then we said, second, daily prayer gives us the chance to express our gratitude for the things he provides. I'm going to let that stay a minute. In case somebody wasn't here last week, I don't want you to say I'm going too fast. But think about that. Soon as I get up and I pray, I got one step over the enemy right away. Why? Because I got an opportunity to share every aspect of my life and God will work on it and bless me. Second, daily prayer gives us a chance to express our gratitude. One of the, one of the most powerful spirits in the world is when we are grateful to God. You know, it's like we as human beings understand the power of being grateful. If someone cooks you a breakfast or someone does something nice for you and you don't say thank you, how do you think they feel? How do you think God feels watching over you every moment of the day and we never say thank you to God? How do you think God feels when we never look up and express our gratitude for a safe night's sleep? So there's two aspects of the power of daily prayer. Somebody says, Pastor, why should I pray in the morning? First, God will get in every aspect of your life. Secondly, prayer will give you a chance to express your gratitude for what God has already done. Third, daily prayer provides a platform for confessing our sins and asking for help in overcoming that sin. Wait a minute. I knew this was going to be that church stuff. Talk about sin. You don't understand. The beauty of being able to confess our sins is that they're already paid for. Hallelujah. Do you know the beauty of being able to confess your sin? Meaning, you sin, I sin. Don't tell me you don't sin. And when we do sin, aren't you glad that Jesus already paid the price? But when I don't confess them, I clutter up my own heart. And I don't realize the condition my heart is getting in. So, I don't know. I, I know show me a Christian that has power. I'll show you one that repents. I'll show you one that's wrestling and struggling with something. If you're one of those goody two shoes Christians telling me you got it all together, then you don't even need God. But the rest of us, the real, you know, the real folk, the real folk, we are we're struggling every day. I may be a pastor. There's days I'm struggling to keep my sins under my. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Don't act like you all that holy. You're not that much better than me. I read my Bible. I pray. I get on my knees, but I'm resting my spirit. As soon as you stop resting with your sins, it means you've lost that connection with God. I am resting. God, take this away. You got to give me a secret. God may take it away. Uh, you know, He took it away last month. In 2019, I let it come back in 2020. It wasn't God, it was me. And it was because I did not do what Jesus said. I got, how many times should I confess it? As many times as you do it. That means your conscience is working. And God's still going to bless you. 
Oh, this is good. Watch this. How do you pray? For daily prayer is an act of worship and obedience. Did you hear that? When I pray, I'm worshiping God. How is it that my feeble words bless God? That's something to shout about right there. It almost gives you a picture that God is sitting in heaven right now. He's, he's blessed me. He's taken me through some trials that I didn't see, seen, and unseen. And all of a sudden, he's waiting on me to say a word like, thank you. And when I say thank you, it's almost like I hear music up in heaven. God is looking down at one of his children who had enough sense to say thank you. Somebody watching me right now, do you know all God needs to turn the power back on is to have you lift a hand and just say thank you. And if you don't know what you're thanking him for, I could give you a whole list, but we just don't have time. There's enough to thank God for. As a matter of fact, I I'll give you this one for free. If you thank God now, it'll cover something that might happen tonight. If you thank God tonight, it might cover something that can happen tomorrow. Matter of fact, when you're off your game, God is always on his. So when you don't confess it, God is sitting in heaven saying, oh, wait, you know it. Then when you confess it and you begin to worship, he unleashes a lethal dose of anointing in your life. Finally, daily prayer is a way to acknowledge who's really in control of my life. Who's really in control of my life? God. As soon as I think I'm in control, I'm in trouble. Well, God is. It's important. It was so important to Jesus that, that not, oh, not pray in the same manner as the hypocrite. So, this is basically where we, we left off last week. And that is the word hypocrites is a pure Greek word, uh, hypocrites. And it just means, I'm going to give you three definitions for hypocrite. If you see yourself in one of these definitions, that means you're a hypocrite. If you're a hypocrite, that means that you've cut off some power. Because here's the difference, and I'm going to show you three phases of a hypocrite, and all of them are bad, but there's some that's even worse than the other. Are you ready? Let me the first kind of hypocrite we had. So, the ancient Greek word hypocrite was an actor. By the first century, the term came to be used for those who play roles and see the world as their stage. We can get so comfortable with God that we can play it being Christians. You good at it. And the Oscar goes to, man, you acted so well. You've been dancing around. Everybody around you think you're so holy. Ooh, if they could just follow us home and see some of the stuff we do. If they could go in our mind and see some of the thoughts we think. Somebody out there know what I'm talking about. I, I am so glad that I have an opportunity and a space to repent. Because the reality is, I have seen myself function in hypocrisy. And I'm so glad that I caught myself. And I'm not ashamed to tell you because that means I have an opportunity to fix it. It's when you're a hypocrite and you don't care that you have a problem with God. There were apparently three kinds of hypocrites. Ready now, right? I told you I was going to do that. Here's the first one. The first one is one who feigns, that's just a good old uh, archaic word, that means one who acts like they're good, but is actually evil and knows that they're being deceptive. That's the bad one. That's the one who uh, the consequences of their evil has not come far enough. So what happens to them is they want you to think they're good. They, you know, they talk in that little voice, oh, thank you. and they, you know, they look all sweet, and they know inside that's their get over move. That's what they're doing to get over on you. You are an evil person, and you're playing with God, and so the power of God is not really in your life. All you're doing is functioning off the mercy of God. But if you're one of those kind of hypocrites, it means you're evil, and you know you're evil. You're the kind of person that does something to somebody and just smile on the inside because you know you're being deceptive, and you know you're not really trying to do what God said. We, I can give you many examples. I want, I want to get somewhere, and then we'll talk about all three of them together. Second kind of hypocrite. The one who is carried away by his own acting <laughs> and deceives himself, being unaware of his own deceit, but not fooling most of the onlookers, or onlookers around him. Here, here's another kind of hypocrite. You are the kind who... You are so carried away with your own action 
you really think that's who you are and you got yourself fooled, but when you walk away, people say stuff like, wow, I don't want them around. And there's something about their anointing, it's a little off. <laughs> there's something about the way they act, it's a little off. And so everybody around you is not fooled, but you have yourself fooled into thinking that's the kind of person you are. Third one, one who deceives himself into thinking he is acting for God's best interest and also deceives only. So here's the worst one. So I say, isn't that, isn't that first one the worst one because they're evil and being deceitful? Or isn't the second one the worst one because, um, you know, they got the self food? Nope. Here's the one that's worse. When you deceive yourself into thinking that you're evil and the way you're acting, your, your destructive personality, your, uh, your talking about and gossiping about folk is for the good of the kingdom. I'm only saying this so we can pray for them, all that kind of stuff. And everybody around know, and God knows, that it's not the best interest of God because the reality is now we're talking Bible. Can I talk Bible for a minute? That is the scribes and Pharisees. They had themselves tricked into thinking. Remember when Jesus went to the temple and he whipped the money changers out of the temple? You know, and that's why I always tell people when they talk about Jesus wasn't a strong man. No, don't play with God. Jesus was who he needed to be. He whipped everybody in the temple and nobody touched him. I don't know how he did it, but I do not play with the power of God. All I know is Jesus walked in there, saw enough unrighteousness, and he started whipping everybody in the temple. All the religious folks who were selling their wares at a higher price, doing a little cheating over here. But the cheating is just for tax for the temple. The cheating is just because we want, we want God's house to be better. So God is saying, no, you got yourself fooled. All of us around. Did you know? I probably could see people when Jesus was whipping those scribes and Pharisees in the temple. I bet you there were people there who were clapping and shouting, saying, Thank God, because they were evil, dressed in the guise of Christianity, and they were just evil people. Do you know anybody like that? I know we're not in church now and here. Because of the virus, you know, we've been practicing social distancing, but I bet you got a few in your mind who you can think about, who you stayed away from because that's the kind of attitude that they had. All right, now we get into this stuff. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. I've been waiting to get to this text. Are you following me in the Bible? Follow me in your, in your scripture. When you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans. The right kind of prayer does not have vain. The word vain is another word for selfish, self-interest, repetition. What that means is if your prayer is like this, bless my house, bless my wife, bless my kids, bless my dog, bless my job, bless my money, and you get up the next day and all you do is keep blessing those same vain it's all about you. You had no direction from the Spirit. You didn't get on your knees and intercede for anybody. God took you through a trial that you can utilize now to flip that anointing around and bless somebody's life. But when you get up in the morning, you're so vain. All you do is check your temperature. I feel hot. Check your body. Check your health. Check your food. Check your car. It's all about you. And God said, that's vain and repetitious. And it's not going anywhere. It's, it's like... God says, you're not exploring the depths of my power. God said, I have power to split the Red Sea. I have power to, to make David fall a giant named Goliath and knock him down with a stone. And you want to sit around and talk, that's the house, that's the battle. That's vain repetition. It's battling in God's ears. Because it has nothing to do with your walk. It has nothing to do with where you are. And you know what normally you know, you know happens? No, 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 no. You get to a place where you're in a crisis. And now you try to be real with God. And you don't even know how to be real. Because you've trained your heart to be deceitful. Now the words you're speaking can't reach God. Look what God says. 
words and no meaning, all lips and no mind or heart. God said, your words have been motivated by your own selfishness and vanity, and they do nothing for the kingdom of God. But we try to impress God or worse other people with our many words. We deny that God is our loving yet holy father. Instead, we should follow the counsel of Ecclesiastes. Can you see this? Five and two. God is in heaven, you are on earth, therefore let your word be few. I remember one of the first things that intimidated me when I became a pastor. I had to go into, you know, one of the platform services. And I tell you, I kid you not, everybody was trying to out-preach everybody. Everybody was trying to out-pray everybody. You ever seen one of those people that stand up and they go, Oh, you're mighty, wise, and everlasting, ecclesiastically saying God up in just words to try to intimidate. They said nothing and touched the heart of God. And I remember, I'm so glad that an older preacher came to me. When I'm sitting there, he could tell I was nervous. And all that preacher said to me is, you're on this program. That means God wanted you on the program. Say what God told you to say. Don't try to impress anybody else. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. You have an anointing that's special from God. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit tell me to tell somebody that. Your anointing is good enough for God. Forget what people say. When you give your heart to God and you give your anointing to God, I am a witness. God will use it and take you to heights you never thought about going because God is the one who's in control and has the real power. So we're talking about real prayer. The reason people are, are, are like prayer is not seen to be this special connection with God is because we don't take prayer and apply it to the a holistically to our total walk with God. If I just take five steps and every five steps I say, thank you, God, for those last five steps. Thank you, God. Do you know how many times I would have to thank God with all of the ways he blesses me and my family? Not us. We wait until there's something vain, something we got, and we'll say, oh, hallelujah. And God is saying, I would rather you just thank me because you trust me than thank me because you want something. I really do. I really do. Christian prayers are measured by weight and not by length. Oh, I like that. I like it. I wrote it. I don't know where I got it from. I did, you know, footnote this whole thing, so I don't think I'm plagiarizing. But I love what this just said. Christian prayers are measured by weight, the weight of your heart. You know that uh, weight is also a word that can be translated into the glory of God when he talks about God coming down. His spirit is weighty. When we see the Shekinah glory of God, it means that the, the, the true nature of God is coming down. When you sometimes, God puts us in positions where we are weighed down so that all of our distractions, all of the things we see are moved out of the way except for our love for God. And then the words that we say are so powerful that they bless us. Can I help you with that? Remember the prodigal son got in his father's face, disrespected his father, took all of his money. I don't want you to see that part because we know the story about what he did. But think about when he was down in that pig pen. A Jewish boy raised Orthodox Jew found himself eating the husk, the slop that the pigs were eating and all of a sudden, the Bible said, he came to himself and he said these words, I'm going home. My father, even my father's servants are treated better than this. I'll just ask him, can I be a servant? Did you hear that? Did you see the transition from this arrogant young man running around spending money, saying I can make it on my own, but when you find yourself in a pig pen, all those other words you said, all those prayers you said meant nothing. I bet you when he was in glory, and when, he, when God was looking down from glory, and he heard this young man say, I'm going home, I'd rather be a servant than to be disobedient any longer to my father. I'm telling you, that is a weighty prayer. That means that God's spirit touched him, and he was anointed. Oh, let's take this back. So I didn't say it, right? Right here. Make sure you look. Spurgeon said it. Yeah, he's a great preacher. But it was, the, the thought is that God is waiting on us to say words that mean something. 
Now, if you want to talk, I'm not going to get spooky on you, but this is one of the most powerful texts in the Bible. Read Matthew 6 and 8. Look what it says. Do not be like them. So he told us, don't be repetition, don't act like them. But then he tells us why. Listen to God. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Wow. God knows what I need before I ask him. Now, I'm going to take a twist here because you got to see this. We're talking about traditional Jews who had twisted the word of God. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was turning it back around, telling them, no, you can't live like that. And he snuck a word in on them. Messed them up. He said, do not be like them for your father. The Jews, I know they grasp at that. They, he shifted into something that will bring the Jews closer to understanding about real prayer. But I want you to see this. Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount was to accomplish two major realities about the kingdom of God, God's power that came with his kingdom. So, when Jesus just shifted, when he said, your father, I want to show you the significance when a bunch of traditional rabbis heard Jesus get personal enough to call God his father. They had no understanding. Jesus said, there's a new kingdom come now. You no longer have to look at God from far off. You no longer have to worry about that. You can talk to him as father. And Jesus said, I want to show you the first reason I came is to tell you that there's a new kingdom and God's power has come with this kingdom. You heard John the Baptist prophesy. He said there was a power coming. There was a Messiah coming. So it was here. And Jesus now is verifying that the kingdom is here. And the second reason he taught this sermon on the mount was his clarity in teaching was to acknowledge God's promised prophesied kingdom that was coming. We just talked about that. And the second reason that he taught, that's why Jesus kept contrasting their sin and twisting the law and, and all that. But the second reason, and one of the most important reasons was oh, their obedience to God allowed Israel to recognize Christ as the promised Messiah and thus allowed them to receive the kingdom of heaven on earth. What am I saying? Jesus said, this is what I'm teaching. First of all, you got to get everything on twisted backwards. You're never going to walk in this kingdom with the way you act. He said, secondly, I'm giving you some intimate details about the kingdom so you know that I am the Messiah. Nobody would know this unless they had walked with the Father. I'm letting you know, you're walking with the original Messiah. You're walking with someone who has the ability to bless you. The sheer anointing and divine knowledge that was spoken by Jesus challenged them to receive him as the prophesied Messiah. Jesus said, that's why the Bible said that they were in awe because he didn't speak as the regular scribes and Pharisees did. He spoke with a wisdom that was beyond his years. He spoke with an anointing. That's why I said, I started this teaching off tonight with, you can't play church. Don't you know what you're missing when you play? If you've never had a real shower of the anointing, but you've been acting all hypocritical, not seeing where God is, that's why you stop the real power from God from coming in your life. And God's going to show us why. He's going to show us why. This verse, verse 8, is powerful. It is about God's providence and foreknowledge regarding our prayer. Don't forget verse 8. Don't be like the vain repetition. Pagans pray because God already knows what you need before you ask. Bing. Stop. Hit it right there. What did you say? God says providence and foreknowledge went before you even getting on your knees and praying. Ah, let me explain it better. If you had been walking and doing what God said that week, when you got down to pray, you might have thought that it was your thoughts. It was really the influence of the Holy Ghost because you've been walking with God. So God said, and I've already set my providential care over your life. Only if you got where you are right now is because when you didn't know the words, I had already set the blessing. Only reason you didn't go under the last time is because when you sinned, I had already set the forgiveness. Somebody help me hear me. He said the only reason that you're still alive and you're able to maneuver through the next trial and you got hope and joy and peace and all that, 
He said, because I have been keeping you in my providential care. When you were out there sinning, God said, I had eyes on you. He said, when you were out there falling apart, I picked the pieces back up again. All I'm telling you is, God is letting us know. Jesus now introduced the word Father. That's what he wants to be to us. That's who he is to us. That's the difference in Jesus' teaching and the scribes and Pharisees' teaching. And then he had a nerve to go with a personal pronoun, your fathers. I bet the some of the scribes and Pharisees fainted. How are you talking about God like that? Let me show you. Check this out. In all the existing books of the Old Testament, in all the existing books of extra-biblical Jewish writing, Josephus, you name it, all the books. Dating from the beginning of Judaism until the 10th century AD, there is not a single reference of a Jewish person addressing God directly in the first person as Father. They were serving God from such a distance. And when you're a hypocrite, you act for us, but deep down inside you know you're not right. So you're really serving God from a distance. You're not really walking in the real power of God. Everybody, none of the Jews call God Father. There are seven names in Judaism. Write this down. This is mess you up. That they cut that they had for God. That once they were written, they would not be erased. Did you know that they had scribes and they had folk who would actually write on parchment and if they wrote the name of God, it was so holy that it could never be erased. Uh, let, let, me, let me explain it to you. So, the first name of God that covers Judaism is the Tetragrammaton. We're going to talk about that. It's not, it's not as big as a scene. The next word is El, which means God. The next word is Elohim, Next word is Eloah. The next word is Eloha. And the next word is El Shaddai. And the next word is Zavah. These are the Jewish names for God. So all of them, now we know an Elohim, the Most High God, uh, Eloi, El Shaddai, the Mighty Breasted God. What they did, they gave God these names so he stayed up in heaven, but they were never down here where they were. He, they, they never could see him as father. All God did, if we go back to Adam and Eve, everything he did in the garden was to have somebody around who would call him father. Everything he did in the garden was so we could love him. Everything he did is to let him, you can't stay on this earth and think you're going to make it to heaven if you never know heaven while you're on earth. Because your thinking is so small. You think of me like the pagans think of me as all these other fables and fairy tales. So you never really know who I am. Let me, let me explain this one because it's probably one you don't know. The Tetragrammaton is the Hebrew name of God that's transliterated in four letters. You know what? Hebrew scholars never wrote the name Yahweh. They would just write four letters which represented Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. So they would never write the word Yahweh. They thought it was too holy. Or J-H-V-H which meant Jehovah. Articulated, those words mean Yahweh and Jehovah. Jesus said, wow, y'all don't even know my dad. Y'all don't even know my father. He said, no wonder you can't serve him. You don't know him. No wonder you're never happy. You ever seen somebody say, if you knew God the way I knew God, you would not let anything bother you right now. We got some problems because there's a lot of people out there who when you pray, your prayer life shows that you don't really know God. Because if you can't start out, Father God, that means you've missed the boat already. Because that's his heart toward us. The first Jewish rabbi to call God Father, watch this, it's so funny, was Jesus. He wasn't, even, he wasn't even a real Jewish rabbi, but the first one who taught, that's all rabbi means, his teacher, and he was a Jew, he was the first one to call God Father. Why? It was a radical departure from the tradition and the fact in every recorded prayer we had from the lips of Jesus, save one, he called God his father. So Jesus called God his father regularly. Why? He wasn't trying to show off. He wasn't making it up because he really knew God was his father. 
That's the difference. When you're not in church and you're not around other people, you're not around preachers, everybody's sleeping in the house, is God your father then? Or is he only your father when you get in trouble? Do you have enough relationship that you just wrote down the word and just right down the road just said, thank you, Father God, because you know that's how much he loves you? It was for this reason. You want to know one of the main reasons Jesus' enemies tried to kill him in the New Testament? I'm going to show you that one of the ones that hurt them more than anything else. Not the fact that he said he was the Messiah. That got him. Not the fact that he went around doing miracles and they couldn't do any. That got him. But that's not the main reason they wanted to kill him. Look, the reason they wanted to kill him the most is because he assumed to have this intimate, personal relationship with the sovereign God of heaven and the creator of all things. And he dared to state himself. Watch this in such intimate terms with God to speak about it. You, they didn't understand. When I show you what the word Father means, it's really going to mess you up. But John 5, 17, 18, write this down. When they were talking about Jesus, they were coming at Jesus. In his defense, Jesus said, my Father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. That's what that describes the Pharisees. They were upset because they didn't have the same relationship that Jesus had with his father. And they didn't like it. John 10, 30, 33, write this down. I and the father are one. Oh, my God. Jesus, you got a nerve. See, the Jews didn't understand the Trinity Judaism to this day does not understand God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. They do not believe in the concept, the biblical understanding that we have of a full God. Look, he said, Jesus answered and said, look, the Jews took up stones, verse 31, to stone him. Jesus answered them and said, I showed you many good works for my Father. For which of them are you stoning me? They weren't stoning him because of his works. They were stoning him because they didn't understand the Jews answered him, for good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. They blow it. Your prayer is not going to work if you don't know who you are. If the only thing that moves your prayer to tears is your pain, you miss your prayer. What should move your prayer to tears is the relationship you have with God. That there is a God who no matter what he's doing will stop what he's doing and listen to you. Isn't that awesome? I, it, it blows my mind that there's a God who knows where I live, what I'm doing, what I'm going through, and if I ever open my mouth, he will listen and hear and bless me. The big difference between believers and religious folks, tell you about the playing book, all you hypocrites, is we know we have a heavenly father who knows the future, the past, and the present. That's what verse 8 means. Jesus said, I know what you need before you ask. The difference between someone who is really working out their salvation and with fear and trembling and knowing how great it is to be connected with God, knowing that I don't have to have anybody else around, I can go into a room and my father is right there. He's that great. Here's the difference between me and somebody pretending. You don't know that he's a God who already took care of my future. Thank God he took care of my past. And he's even working on my present. First, so what's the difference? Here's how we look at our father. Here's what makes us excited about it. First, you have a father who chose you in the first place. That right there. Da -da -da -da, blow the horn, shout. How many people know them know that God chose you and already gave you a leg up right there? Come on, you know, come on with the evil stuff. You know it's something that God chose somebody. When I think about all the evil I'm capable of doing and God chose me to be a pastor, I think God, something wrong with him. But you know what it is? It's like us with our children. 
We believe our children can do anything if they get the right condition. That's what God believes. So the first thing that should make you excited about having the Heavenly Father is He chose you. Ephesians 1 and 4. Here's what I like about He chose me. He chose me before the foundation of the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in Him in His love. Watch this. So God said, with all I've done, and you I'm taking my fingers out here. Watch. All the mess I've done, y'all think I'm going to tell you what I did, don't you? I'm not. I ain't got no fingers. <laughs> but I want to tell you this. With all the stuff that I've done, in this something, look at that word. He still calls me unblameable. Hallelujah. I got enough to blame myself for. And God had enough. And here's the good thing. I'm unblameable and holy in his sight. So sometimes I got to catch up with what he thinks about me. That's how bad I can be. But he chose me. Not only that, John 6, 37 says, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whatever, whoever comes to me, I will never draw them away. So the first thing is, God said, All them who the Father gives. So please don't, don't get this thing messed up. You're sitting there whole, if you are whole, maybe you're going through a storm right now, but you're still pretty whole. It's because God chose you first. That's why you know he's your Father. Secondly, we're adopted as sons and daughters of God. So not only is Jesus giving me the privilege to say father, but the word tells me legally because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he opened a door like an adoption agency. So Jesus was the firstborn, but now I'm in the family. I am a legal son of God, John 1 and 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. So what, he, what he's saying is, Everybody who believes on him becomes his son if you're really a believer and not a pagan. And Romans 8, 15, I love this. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to be the son of being adopted to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba means Father. Abba was a Jewish term of endearment that a child would say to their father. Abba was the first word the baby would speak. Jesus said, what we really should be saying is daddy, Papa God, Abba. We should be that, we should know he loves us enough that we can call him our father, no matter what our trial we're going through. Thirdly, he providentially planned our lives. So don't let the big word providential fool you. Hear what God is saying. Everything you need in life, I've already planned for you. And I worked it out so that you would be blessed through it. Look at Jeremiah 1 and 4. I love this. Before I formed you in the womb. That messed me up sometimes. God said, now I know I was not trying to come to Jesus when I came. How many will admit I was not trying to find God, I was trying to find Bart. I was not trying to find God, I was trying to find me some fun. Fun had run out. And somehow the Holy Spirit drew me into God. And I didn't realize that providentially I was coming anyway. Because the Bible says before I was formed in the womb, I knew you. He knew me. Before you were born, I set you apart. He set me apart. He thought you were different because of who you are, didn't he? No. Man, God put that spirit in you. Uh, I anointed you, I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. That's what he said, Jeremiah. Just put yourself there, though. Whatever you're doing, he appointed you to do. So he providentially planned your life so it's not left to chance. So let me just ask you this. Here's the big question. If God knows what I need before I ask him, if he chose me, he providentially planned my life, he knew me, he made me his son, why in the world should I pray? If you have not written anything down else I said tonight, please catch this. Because that can make somebody say, well, if God already knows, why should I pray? Let me tell you why. Five reasons to pray, even though God knows what we want and what we need. Here they are. Drum roll. Love this. First one. We pray because he invites us and commands us to pray. 
may not sound like much, but let me explain it to you. Jesus gave a parable encouraging us to pray and never give up. Here's the command. Luke 18, 1. Men are always pray and not faint. Stop. Here's why we pray. Because God commanded us to pray and invited us to pray. If God didn't want us to pray, even though he knows everything, he wouldn't have us pray. Now this verse tells us prayer helps us even though God has already blessed us. He said we ought to pray so we don't faint. Which tells me, if I don't pray, I will faint. So you want to know why you should pray? If you don't pray, you're probably going under. Second reason. God who ordained the end, ordained the means to the end. <laughs> okay? So God said, I know everything you need, but I ordained that the only way you get it is to pray. So if I made up the means to get to an end, then you better do what I told you to do so you can get to the end. You can't tell me I don't need to pray when I'm telling you that prayer is the way I designed it. Psalms 2 and 8. Ask for me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. What's really funny about that, write that, write that scripture down, let's stay there a minute. Here's what, here's, let me break it down to you. God is saying, the means to the end is you must pray. I could just give it to you, but I commanded it to pray. Now, the only way you get it is to pray. So that's why you got to pray. Even though I know what you need already, I need you to pray. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Let's go back and look at that. You know the text. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Third, God chose to honor our obedience. I love this. God chose to honor our obedience. Watch this. Prayer puts us on our knees, reminding us who you may wish to be cynical if you want to. Answer prayer is not a coincidence. So if you get cynical, you may say, answer prayer is just a coincidence. No, God put us on our knees so that we could get the things that God has for us. So watch this. James 4 and 2. Very simple. God said, I know what you need, but here's what God said. You have not because you ask not. It's this simple. Look how simple that is. You have not because you ask not. Wow. Four. God knows our need but dignifies us by letting our prayer make a difference. Here's the fourth reason we should pray. Let's get you through. Here's the fourth one. Because it is not just an old saying, it's true. Prayer changes things. Now, I could sit here and be a little facetious and tell you prayer changes the heart of God, but we know that God is omniscient, He already knows. But there's several biblical instances where Moses prayed and changed God's mind. It looked that way. We can pray and God will back off. God will have mercy on us. All I'm saying is. That's the kind of God. He's designed it so that the prayer makes a difference. Write this scripture down. This is bless you. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one, one to another, another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effectual. So if I don't pray, I'm walking around with a disease I don't have to have. If I don't pray, I'm walking around missing hours of sleep when I could be sleeping like a baby. All because I was not obedient to God. And the fifth reason is God promises to answer prayer. That's the best one. God said, I will answer prayer. Not when we stay on the sidelines, but when we actually pray. This means he will act when we pray. It also means he may not act until we pray. I got to emphasize that. He said, I'm going to act when you pray, but if you don't pray, I may not act. How do I know that? How do I know God is waiting on us to call? Some of us have been in a situation, if you got children, you'll know that your children, especially if they're grown, may have a need, and you want to fill that need the best you can. But sometimes you won't get it, they won't ask you for it. Because you know it won't do them any good until they knock on the door and ask. 
And that's all God is saying. As your father, all I need you to do is not and ask because you will prosper by the prayer. So, I'm not going to get through this Lord's Prayer, but we're going to start here tonight. I want to share something with you. It's the next part of the text. It goes into verse, uh, verse 9. It says, now Jesus has set the stage. He lowers the boom. Instead of praying the traditional way, this is how kingdom people pray. This, is re this really is not starting because he had just started, uh, stated how inefficient the prayers had become. So let's, let's, let's catch this up. Here's what happened. You wonder why the Lord's Prayer is stuck in there. If you go to Luke 11 and you go to Matthew 6, you'll see that both of these prayers are the Lord's Prayer. One account, in Luke, it says, his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. In Matthew, he's teaching his disciples how to pray. So what I need you to understand is he had just, all that stuff he was doing about prayer was to get them to the place that they knew how to pray. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, and this is how you pray. So, I know how to pray, Pastor. No, let's follow what Jesus said about prayer. So he said, this then is how you should pray. We look at Luke's gospel or Matthew's gospel. He's saying the same thing. Real believers know how to pray. And he already started. So here's what he said real believers do. They start off with our Father in heaven. I want you to write this terminology down because here's how you know who you are. The fatherhood of God. It is actually a theological classification. It's an area of study. We study something called the fatherhood of God. You know, we just came from Father's Day. But the reality is the fatherhood of God is God's ability to take care of us. The teaching of the fatherhood of God was natural to Jesus. It appeared on his lips some six. Jesus actually said 65 times in the Synoptic Gospels, he talked about God being his Father, and over 100 times in just the Gospel of John. You know, John's Gospel is not the Synoptic Gospel. It's the one that had a different picture of Jesus. He said, God is my Father, 65 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he said over 100 times just in John. The Exact term Jesus used is still found three times in the New Testament. We can look at those scriptures. I'm going to leave that up there for a minute. But elsewhere, the Aramaic term Abba is translated by the Greek pattern Atha. What does it say? Most of the time in the Greek, they were talking about Abba, Father, term of endearment. Or it was talking about the, uh, a patriarchal sense, being my dad. Provider, those who take care. One is, one is the one who provides and one is the one who loves me through and is, is a term of endearment. There are three unique teachings on the Jesus, on the fatherhood of Jesus. First, the rarity of this designation of God is still striking, meaning that you say Father God, it still does something to your heart even now. Way back then, Jesus introduced it because it's part of the kingdom that's here now. We have to say, Father God. There is no evidence in pre-Christian Jewish literature that, Jew, that Jews address God as Father. The second unique feature about Jesus' use of Abba as a designation for God involves the intimacy of the term. Abba was a term, and I already told you this, that little children use for their fathers. And Jesus said, I can go and call my Father God. At one time, the thought was, since children use this term to address their fathers, the nearest equivalent would be the English term, dad. A third unique feature of Jesus' teaching concerning the fatherhood of God, here's the, here's the blessing. The rest of the New Testament also emphasizes the fatherhood of God. In the Pauline letter, God is described as Father over 40 times. Let's recap. 65 times Jesus said it in the Gospel. It's not the Gospel, just Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 100 times he said it just in the Gospel of John. The love book. John was the disciple that put his head on Jesus' breast. And then we find out Paul, in writing, adapted it so we, as new believers in the New Testament under a new covenant, could say, so it's described at least 40 times in the Pauline's in the Pauline Gospels. So, okay, in blessings, Romans 1, Corinthians 1 and 3, so 
The word Father is used when we get our blessings. Write those scriptures down so I can move on. Doxologies. Romans 15 and 6. In thanksgiving. I'm going to leave these up so you don't have to worry about me taking down so you can write it down. In doxologies, in thanksgiving, in prayer, in all of those things we call God our Father. We lift our hands and thank Him as Father. And in exhortations, when we are trying to exhort, we exhort by calling God our Father or saying God is your Father. We want you to know that you have a Father God. And finally, in all of our creeds, creeds are established doctrines. For Paul, this fatherhood is now, I want you to get this, is not based so much on God's role in creation, but rather on the redemption and reconciliation he has made available to us in Jesus Christ. So I want you to look. Y'all see me up here getting my head signals, right? This is my music get ready to play. Bang! Right on cue. But I want you to know something. This teaching, Father God, I need you to go back and look at the power of prayer. Don't just babble, vain repetitions. But Jesus said, I know what you need even before you ask. But you still pray because it changes things. You still pray because God commanded you. You still pray because he wants us to ask. You still pray because that's what he set up. And then we learn what Jesus said. I have a father. Next week, we're going to look at the kingdom structure of the Lord's prayer. Why don't I just give you a sneaky creepy of it? I'm not going to do a lot. But first of all, which I just told you this part, relating to our father. The first thing you need to learn about the Lord's prayer, don't you miss this, I'm going to show you how there is so much power in God's prayer because of our relationship to Him. Power stops. Don't play. Too much at stake. There's some power God wants to bring into your house right now. While you're looking at me and looking at this teaching, there's somebody you need to pray for. You got a child you need to pray for. You got some finances you need to pray for. You, you got some peace you need to pray for. You got some stability. You fool everybody else around you. Come on, man, you know you're not going to lose it. You got some stability to pray for. And you got some sins that are taking over your life. You want to stop the power of God? It's your choice. I'm just telling you, in this environment, we can see how our world is crumbling. The morals, the values. The only thing we got to stand on is the Word of God. Walk in kingdom power. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you tonight for the word. Thank you for being my father. Thank you, God, I can get in those situations and just like a child, I can reach out and call you and you show up. Thank you, God, that I know how to pray and you answer my prayers. Now, if there's someone out there who's not saved, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I need some help. I believe you died for my sins. You rose again with all power in your head. Because I confess, say this now, I am saved. If you pray that little prayer, your life just changed. This Pastor Dunn, you join us on Sunday, parking lot live. Pray for us, we're going live. God has been blessing us with good weather and anointing. Stay with us. Go to our YouTube channel, Shiloh Baptist 2. We're just in the setup, it's working, but go there, Shiloh Baptist TWO, all one word. Or go to our Facebook channel and go to our Facebook and watch our many messages there. Watch the work that we're doing here. Bless you for tuning in and have a great night. It's back.